A very good morning to you and welcome to The Key Points with me, Abna Tebi. We are live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, as well as around the world on 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. It is the fourth day of June, July, sorry, 2020, and we are back here to look at issues of national concern. And on the show this morning, we shall be looking at the voter registration exercise. Now, as scheduled, the Electoral Commission commenced voter registration on Tuesday, the 30th of June, 2020, at all of its 33,367 registration centers across the country. Now, prior to the commencement of the voter registration exercise, the issue which was on the front burner of public discourse was the deployment of security personnel to border towns in the country. Now, the opposition NDC described the deployment of soldiers as a military siege in the eastern border towns and other border areas of the country, which they consider their strongholds. Now, government, on the other hand, maintains that the deployment is to prevent the foreign, or to prevent sorry, foreigners from participating in the voter registration exercise to ensure the integrity of the voters register when eventually compiled. On the show this morning, we shall review the voter registration exercise so far and matters arising. We'll also turn our attention to some developments between the Office of the President and the Auditor General, where the Auditor General uh, replied the President, and you will recall that the President, by a letter dated 29 June 2020, directed the Auditor General, uh, Mr. Daniel Domelovo, to proceed on an accumulated leave of some 123 working days pending his retirement. Now, the president in the set letter cited a precedent site, um, set by Professor Mills of Blessed Memory, asking the then Auditor General to proceed on leave pending his retirement. Now, the president's letter has attracted mixed reactions from the public. While the public commentary has been ongoing, um, the Auditor General himself has responded to the president's letter by a letter dated the 3rd of July, 2020. In this set letter, the Auditor General, among others, raises the issue about the implications of the President's Directive for the independence of the Office of the Auditor General as guaranteed by the Constitution 1992. Now, making the rounds on social media this morning is also a response to the letter from the Auditor General, which is coming from the Presidency, stating, among others, that the position held by the Auditor General is not the correct position of the law. Now on the show this morning, we shall be interrogating the back and forth or the tussle between the presidency and the office of the Auditor General, as well as uh, the Auditor General's particular response and other matters arising. When we're done with these, we'll turn our attention to our fight against COVID-19. Now we shall be discussing or talking to the experts as usual to understand exactly what the situation is, looking at the steady increase or surge in our cases and the death toll. Now, unfortunately, we have recorded um, well, one of the recent deaths, uh, taking our death toll to another level, has to do with um, the death of Kojo Owusu Efriye, aka Sir John, who was uh, a former or who yes formerly held the general secretary position of the npp but up until his death he was the ceo of the forestry commission indeed our condolences go out to the bereaved family and indeed to all families who have lost their loved ones to COVID 19. we do hope that we are able to stem the tide as soon as possible so on the show we shall be um, setting the spotlight on our fight against COVID-19 and how well we're doing so far, or are we losing that fight? This is what we have for you this morning on The Key Points. Stick and stay with us, we'll be right back. But do remember that the program is powered by Airtel Tigo Extra. Airtel Tigo, life is simple. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. 
also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So starting off, we'll be looking at uh, the voter registration exercise and how soon, how far it's gone. Uh, the EC commenced the exercise on Tuesday, the 30th of June 2020, and it's going to go through till the 6th of August 2020. Uh, the EC started in all 33,367 registration centers across the country. And there's been a number of issues that have popped up here and there. Uh, we'll be speaking to the EC, uh, represented by Dr. Sribo Kweku. Uh, he's the director of um, electoral services at the EC. Also, we have uh, the representatives from the two dominant parties, talking about the NPP and NDC, in the persons of Honorable um, Samuel Okuja to Ablakwa and Sami Jemfi, who is the national organizer of the new patriotic party. Sami, sorry, Sami Iwuku, my, my apologies for that. Sami Iwuku, who is the national organizer of the new patriotic party, NPP, via Zoom. But before we start the conversation, let's take a look at some stories that uh, were put out in respect of the voter registration exercise in the course of the week. At about 8 a.m., when the news team arrived at the City Engineers Center, registration had not started. The atmosphere was that of an easy calm. Voters were obviously angry. I stood up early morning to come and uh, uh, be in the queue to, to do the new registration uh, card. So I'm too much worried. What is going on is too bad. I'll be at 3 o'clock. I care what I'm going to do. I'll be at 4 o'clock. I heard that there's some problem here yesterday. So the officers, all of them have gone to the police station to meet. I don't know what is going on. I'm just waiting. Two hours later at 10 a.m., the local announcer indicated that the process could start soon. <laughs> The divisional commander, DCOP, J. Obonsu, told me the delay was as a result of a misunderstanding the day before. The discussion had to do with uh, um, some confusion that arose as a result of the, the review of the registration centers by the Electoral Commission. Um, I think um, it was a bit different from what had been gazetted, and um, so it created a bit of confusion. But then after the meeting, it has been resolved. All the stakeholders have really understood what has happened and they've all given the green light for the registration to start. He assured of the security's preparedness to ensure a safe exercise after a resolution was reached. We have had enough deployment of personnel here. There are others that you can't see and um, we, we hope that that will be enough to contain any issue that may crop up. The electoral... Some members of the opposition National Democratic Congress arrived at the center to hold a news conference to register their grievances over some concerns about the exercise, but the applicants would not allow. I told the policeman to call reinforcement because the NDC people came in to have press conference in between the boot A and then the boot B. And some of the executives of the NDP are telling them this is wrong, it's unlawful. They won't allow that. And it was about to turn into something else. Right now, I'm a Penya Kacha and say there's a sickness around. It's a sorry crime and quite sorry. It's a quite sorry, but right now, no. Yeah, but yeah, registration. Social distance now, meaning more and when you're too much. Some of those who had registered were still roaming at the center. I am here today also to assist. I rented the chairs for them. As a good citizen, I rented the chairs yesterday and today also. I came to arrange, yes, to continue with the good work I'm doing. That is an divisional police commander. ASP George Atia explained that decision by the NDC to hold a news conference was against the electoral regulations. This is because of the incident that happened here later. That is why some are still agitated. And then the, the, the answer is possible. But as like I said earlier on, I have spoken to executive and advised them to move away. The registration exercise was, however, not disrupted.
So those were some uh, scenes from uh, some registration centers during the course of the week. Again, this program is sponsored by Airtel Tigo Extra, and Airtel Tigo has this to say, that it's the season for extra, and social distancing doesn't mean you can stay close to your family, friends, and work. That's why Airtel Tigo says it's time. It's time for extra by giving you more of your call and data bundles. Choose from Airtel Tigo's Big Time Extra, Big Time Data Extra, Fuse Extra, or Extra Unlimited, and get extra. It's time for extra. You feel them? Just dial star one 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 hash to choose a plan today. Airtel Tigo, life is simple. So moving on, we'll get on to Zoom right away and speak with our guests who are waiting for us. We have um, the Honorable Samu Kujatu Ablakwa. He's the MP for North Tongu, also a ranking member on the Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament. Also, we have Dr. Sribo Kweku, who is the Director of Electoral Services with the Electoral Commission. And lastly, we have Sami Ewuku, who is the national organizer of the New Patriotic Party NPP. Good morning, gentlemen, and thanks for your time. I'll start with you, um, Ms. Um, Dr. Srebo Kweku. Um, Doc, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Very well, great. So thanks for your time once again. Um, it's uh, the fifth day into the registration exercise. You started on Tuesday, the 30th, it's Saturday. Um, you issued, or that is the EC issued a press release and indicated that the first day, or you were satisfied with the events of the first day of the registration exercise. Now, you also indicated that uh, there were some teething issues which you noted and that you would be addressing them. First of all, let us know, um, five days into the exercise, how have how have, has it gone and what were these teething issues you talked about and how has it been addressed? Thank you very much. My regards to Honorable and uh, Sami. And all Hi, good morning, I'm getting to your listeners in the US. Good morning. What I, was, what I would say that because the new machine and new system, when we started on the first day, automatically, some people have not used the machine before, with the exception of the time that they trip. So we have we had a lot of technicians on the ground. Mm -hmm. Some petty petty challenges came. We didn't know how to handle them. Then the technicians helped them. We have already put in place mechanism that different levels of technicians with high knowledge from the district region to national. So depending on the challenge, when it crops up, they will talk to whoever the chain demands. And when it is beyond the, uh, the, the technician, the DC level it goes to the region. It would, if the region cannot support national, and in the course of it, if we read that it may affect the registration, we have standby kits. Then we repair the kit and send it to the place where it can be addressed. But I would say that larger, larger, and larger and uh, that by and large, it has been very successful. Our major challenge has been the, uh, the, the observation of the social distancing. Mm -hmm. If you take that one away, I would say that it has been very marvelous. Yesterday, for instance, one center raised 288 in a day. So right. that's tell. And I've asked that now. A lot of them are going beyond the 100 when we have set 100 as our average. So in terms of the quantum of work being done, it has been very marvelous. The challenge was the protocol, social mm -hmm. distancing, which is being abused at certain levels. Right, but, 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 know, but Doc, how is that being addressed? You, you do say that if you take the challenges with social distancing away, the exercise so far has been successful. But obviously, we all know that these are um, not normal times, and so that cannot simply be you know, dis dis disregarded. What is being done specifically to ensure that uh, the protocols okay. are adhered a lot, to. A lot, a lot of uh, steps are being taken. One of it is that now we have asked our people to, you know, the new new system has inbuilt a QQ control system. What it does is that the officers can decide that in a day we can register, let's say, 150 or 200. 
then the system will generate numbers with dates that they can give it then them the numbers then those who are already in the queue that they cannot be covered then they can give them the next day's queue numbers so they can go and come the next day that's mm -hmm. one the second one is that we have decided and informed our officers that whoever comes there and the person has a, a propensity to be flouting their regulations, you ask the person to go and organize himself or herself and come. So those people should, should not be registered. Once they are flouting, they should go back and come and prepare to obey by the instructions. The next one is that we have asked the security persons that they should help us to uh, implement the protocols. So most cases, those within the demarcated areas are people who abide by them. But before they went to the demarcated areas, that's where you see a lot of them fighting, queues and the rest. Mm -hmm. But I believe that we are dealing with adults. They should know that the disease is real. It affects people. People are dying by that. So even before you even think of going to the research center, you should have gone by the rules governing the protocol. We don't need to go with be uh, attacking them and the rest. And it's a bunch of everybody to help educate the people. When you are moving in town, you see a lot of people not wearing the mask and the rest. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it is when they come to the things and that they should, so it should be part and parcel of us. Mm -hmm. So when you can get used to it, then you can carry that one to the police station to observe it. Again, we are also uh, coming out with this uh, more mobile teams. Mm -hmm. So that when there are queues, long queues in the centers, these mobile teams will be released, they will go there, help create the long queues so that all this will help reducing the congestions or the crowd overcrowding at the residence centers. Very well. Now, Doc, uh, quickly before I go to the other uh, co-panelists, the, the Ghana Medical Association in a statement is saying, and let me quote them directly, that the EC chairperson and other members of the commission should ultimately be held responsible and accountable for any wanton disregard for or non-enforcement uh, of the COVID-19 preventive measures at any voter registration center. Uh, that has the potential to spread the disease. What do you say to this? Because ultimately they are, they are saying that you have the responsibility to ensure that the numbers are controlled, you cordon off certain areas and allow people to come in in regulated um, numbers or in a regulated fashion. What do you say to this statement by the Ghana Medical Association? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't agree with them. As I said, they, we are dealing with adults and they should be responsible for the actions. It is when the people are ignorant, they are minors, juveniles, that we say that the parents are held responsible for the actions of their children. We are directing people who are 18 years and of sound mind. So we, all of us, should help educate them to know that they have to be very careful about the, their health surroundings. Anything that can affect their health, they should be responsible for them. And but it's Doc, also the responsibility of all of us, all stakeholders. But yes. Doc, sorry, sorry to cut you. We do appreciate the fact that, yes, there's a certain level of responsibility on the persons who come there. But the EC is at the helm of affairs now in terms of the registration exercise. You are the authorities and you can enforce the measures as expected. And so at the end of the day, ultimately, the buck stops with you again. And so to put it at the doorstep of the individual citizens would be, you know, for lack of a better phrase, checking the ultimate responsibility the EC has. In any case, the EC chairperson, when addressing uh, the nation prior to the commencement of the exercise, did indicate that the EC would take all steps and ensure that these protocols are enforced. I think you are not being fair to us. If you, I, I've just taken you through the steps that we have taken. But we cannot force people who are moving around, who have decided not to obey by the uh, protocols. That's what I'm saying that we have even asked the police that if, if need be, those we can be arrested. So we will do our part, but it's left to others to also complement what we are doing. If you if you lock your door and somebody will come and break the door, I don't think you, you, you should be held responsible for somebody breaking into your door to come and steal. So we are putting in place all the protocols. If you go to any residence and the where the commission is implementing what we pray to do, but we need the people to also respond to what we have put in place. That's what I'm saying. 
to push it a little further, um, Doc, I mean, just let's analogize with what happens on um, the day of elections with ballot boxes. The EC uh, does all that it can to ensure that people don't pick ballot boxes and run away with it. Because I believe left to it, some people would want to do that. But it is your responsibility to yeah, ensure that doesn't do. happen. So the question do. then it is, do. why don't we ensure that we enforce the, the protocols as expected? Because obviously, it is likely to turn people away from going to register. Uh, uh, from the, the, the analogy you give, are you also not aware that people will take the ballot boxes and run away with them? So you like me saying, you will come out with the protocols. You will come out with the modalities. You will want to implement them. The people should also help to uh, implement them so that nobody will suffer because of the registration. When you, when I, and that's what I said, when you move around town, people behave as if nothing is happening in Ghana. Mm. But all of us should help educate Ghanaians to know that we are not in normal times. So we should be careful of what we do so that we don't contract this disease. Commission will do whatever it can, but we need the support of the people who we are trying to protect you. But very quickly, lastly, before I go to Honorable Okujita Blackwa and um, Samia Wuku, have, have there been any arrests of persons who have flouted the COVID-19 protocols um, within the premises of registration centers? I, not to my knowledge. Not mm. to my knowledge. Very well. Let me quickly bring in um, Honorable Okujita Blackwa. Honorable. It's five days into the registration exercise. Your party has had cause to complain about a number of things uh, regarding the deployment of uh, military men in certain areas. We'll be looking at that. But for now, let me have your impressions about the exercise as has um, occurred over the five-day period and your thoughts on the social distancing issue, which has become a big matter and, and you know, worth discussing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to you and good morning to uh, colleagues on the panel and to all our distinguished uh, viewers. The point must be made that this exercise, uh, as we have always maintained as a political party, uh, could really uh, have been uh, avoided. We still hold a view, uh, like many other civil society organizations, and seg segments of our society, that we really uh, could have um, used the um, uh, existing voters register. But that appears to be water under the bridge now. So we just want to always restate this point for the record. And uh, if you look at what is happening now uh, with the uh, lack of social distancing, the Ghana Medical Association emphasizing that this is going to lead to a second wave of infections and that we are going to see a spike which already we are seeing as i speak to you uh the current count is is is, is fast approaching twenty thousand with, with, with over with over a uh, hundred deaths so uh, we need to pay attention to this uh, uh, social distancing challenge mm. and the COVID 19 protocols that are not being adhered to i would want to see listening to dr sri wakwaku I would want to see a more uh, active electoral commission. I agree with him that it should be a collective effort, like we are doing in North Tong. I have provided chairs at all my centers, and uh, we have teams that are enforcing social distancing. To augment what the, the, the EC has done, um, later today, uh, I would also be uh, initiating a disinfecting program where every uh, day, uh, will disinfect the chairs that we have provided uh, at the various centers. But you, not every, you know, um, constituency can have that done. So yeah, so Honorable, tell us how, how, how that is being done in your constituency. I think it's worth sharing. If, if, if that is a success story, then let's hear you. How are you able or how is your constituency able to ensure social distancing? Are you saying that you haven't had issues of crowding where people are mm. flouting the regulations? No, not at all. We, 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 we haven't had any issue of, of crowding. Um, what helps us in Northton is that sometime last year, I had, uh, I had made a donation of uh, almost 10,000 uh, plastic chairs to the various uh, communities, the various uh, polling stations. We call them branches, uh, as, uh, which is the, the, the cell in 
in how we organize our party. So those chairs have been made available uh, because I predicted that if you say that people should come to a center and uh, you don't have adequate provision of chairs, especially the single seater chairs, then uh, you are going to have a challenge because people standing, it will soon become a mailing crowd. So we have teams that arrange the chairs uh, within the social distance limits, the one meter rule, before the uh, day starts at uh, 7 a.m. every day. Uh, so by 5 a.m. our teams are deployed. And now we are um, initiating what I'm calling the disinfecting program, where because so many people are using the chairs and you don't know the status of those who come and sit in this chair. So uh, I have an agreement with Zoom Lion and uh, we are disinfecting the chairs as well so that every day, every day you have a very active disinfection going on so that you can have you know, transfer by the fact that people are coming and touching the chairs. You know that we have been advised by the experts that uh, avoid uh, uh, or limit the touching of, of surfaces right. because you can't be sure uh, who has has uh, the, who has used the, uh, the chair or the table or whatever surface you are you are going to you know mm. uh, come into contact with. Mm. So that's what we we are doing. But as I was saying, I would want to see the Electoral Commission uh, play a more active role because they are the, the, the lead organization that is conducting this uh, register. Mm. We had assurances from the EC that they will make sure that all the centers uh, follow the COVID-19 protocols. Mm. I, I want to see uh, a clear message go out from the EC that look, if we uh, must start the, the registration every day by 7 a.m., when we come to the center, we set up, we notice that we don't have adequate chairs, we will, we will, we will reach out to stakeholders. Look, there are churches, there are um, uh, youth groups, there are all kinds of business entities who uh, can, can, can support. Then we will also make sure that the arrangements are in such a way that you are well spaced out. If you don't have your face marks, you will not be served and all of that. Let's put the health of our people first. I have met many people, many friends who are scared to go to the registration mm -hmm. centers to get registered because they fear that they will just contract right. the uh, COVID-19 virus. This should so, not be uh, a COVID-19 uh, uh, registration festival. We are registering to vote, not registering to contract COVID-19. Well. So let's Thanks. let's do more to protect mm. to protect the centers. But right. I must also say that in terms of the actual beyond the uh, the health concerns, mm -hmm. which which is paramount, uh, the the EC's deployment, uh, the machines appear very very slow, and the one size fits all. I am concerned about that when I go around, even in my my polling stations in my constituency, mm -hmm. you have very large polling stations. And they are entitled to just one kit, one machine, mm -hmm. one registration kit. Mm -hmm. You go to some polling stations with fewer numbers, far fewer numbers. They are also using one kit. Couldn't the EC have had, you know, uh, a, 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 a graduated approach so that beyond a certain threshold, a certain number of registered voters at the polling station, you will have more kits okay. to be able to capture right. the people. I will, I will, I will in, put that in, to Dr. Swibor to address, because you are raising the issues about the proportional arrangement of or deployment of the devices, which is a, a legitimate one, I believe. But let me bring in Mr. Sami Ewuku right about now. Can you hear me, um, Mr. Sami Ewuku? Yes, good morning. Great. I can hear you. You're right. Thanks for your time. Um, five days into Thank the election. Thank you very elections. much for having me. And uh, good morning to Dr. Sirwa Kwekwen. A good friend and brother I haven't seen in a long while. You're not all here to have black. Good morning, Samit. Right. So we're looking at five days into the voter registration exercise. Your thoughts? Do you, yes. Are you satisfied with how things have gone? A lot of issues have come up regarding uh, social distancing and the fact that lots of people um, seem to be flouting that. The EC is being... Um, asked to be more, to be more um, active in respect of, of that. Your thoughts? Well, um, 
I mean, it's, it's day five. Um, I, I'm one of the people who will agree that in the first few days, uh, we saw people not strictly adhering to the social distancing protocols. But let me commend the EC that they seem to be improving day by day. I've had the opportunity of touring several centers and several constituencies. And again, I like the approach of the Honorable Member of Parliament for that time, where he is also determined to assist mm -hmm. the Electoral Commission uh, as a major stakeholder for him as a Member of Parliament and with an interest in the ongoing exercise. Also assisting to, and I use his words, um, to augment what the EC is doing uh, to help protect lives at the various registration centers. There are things that the EC can also exercise control, and things that will also be very difficult for them. And I'll give you a typical example. You get to a registration center, and you see the person um, going through the protocols by washing uh, the, the hands uh, with soap and the running water, after all, sanitizes the hand. And then the person goes to hug a brother or friend that he or she has seen in the queue. And in such instances, before the easy procedure, a person would have had or shook hands with a colleague that he or she had not met in a while. So it also has to do with the attitude of our people. But again, the first day for me was very problematic. Likewise, in some centers, the second day as well. But going on again on the third day and the fourth day, I saw that people were gradually getting used to the fact that our, our way of life uh, has also changed and it's changed dramatically. And we cannot continue to do the same things we've been doing over the years. I am convinced that um, regardless of even this exercise, and that's why I disagree with people who say that, I mean, this whole exercise obviously is also going to lead to an escalation in terms of our numbers. Um, yes and no, because um, if not this registration, and you still go to find people in the Wachi queue, in the, in, the, in the food chain, in the food queue, and all that, and people still not going by these laid down protocols, it's also going to lead to an escalation of these figures. But the well, congregation at the registration centers definitely um, cannot be compared to what you would see at, yeah, yeah, for, for instance, it's, it's a, a watch joint. I'm that, yes, it's a worry. But if you if you cannot also go through this process now, how are you going to go through the process during voting? Because you're still going to have people mass up at the various centers and in the queues as well. So we have to understand that the effective February this year, um, the world has changed and our way of life has been gravely affected. And the attitude of our people must also be tilted towards the fact that we can no longer continue to live the way we live. And um, what I want the EC to also ensure is that um, once the chairs are spaced out, I've been to centers where um, people who, 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 who were not having face masks, they should, because now the EI, you know, before you leave your homes, you should have a face mask. Mm -hmm. So you have people also not even understanding that wearing of the face mask is, is to protect you and to protect your brother or your sister. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've been to centers where maybe the hand sanitizer that I have in my car, how to support people. And likewise, my colleagues, and just as the Honorable Member of Parliament is saying, he also provides chairs mm -hmm. to also augment or assist the East. It's a shared responsibility. It cannot be left for the EC alone, because they, they may not have the capacity to control almost everybody. We, the political parties, and for us as political parties, we must also ensure that we protect our supporters who are in the queue and our supporters who are also eager to exercise their franchise come uh, December 2020. Mm, very well. Thank you for that. Now, Dr. Kweku, um, Honorable Okujata Blackwa raised an issue. Doc, can you hear me? Hello, Doc. Dr. Shabakweku, can you hear me? No, I think we are. Uh, if you could kindly unmute. Uh, your... Yes, I, I'm, I'm not good. Yes, v I very well. Now. Thank you. Um, Doc, um, Honorable Okuja Tuablaku and his submissions uh, raised a point about um, the kind of deployment that the EC engaged in. And I think it's within the context of saying that perhaps if the process of registration were to be expedited, then you would have uh, less people 
congregating in the registration centers because they come in and they are able to go through, they finish with their protocols, COVID-19 protocols, and they go through their registration exercise. Now, he raises an issue about um, devices being deployed to certain areas and uh, is asking why the EC uh, would not necessarily provide more devices to areas that have larger populations, but would necessarily deploy one to each center. Could you kindly speak to that? Is that the case or um, there's something to the contrary? First, I will commend my two colleagues for their own way of also supporting the system. Like I've been saying, it is a collective responsibility. Instead of maybe trying to blame somebody, else, let us all know that we have a responsibility towards Kenyans. And Kenyans also have the responsibility towards themselves. So first, all of us should help educate the people to go by the protocols. That's one. I'm, I'm happy with uh, the two the two summits. My, my, <laughs> I'll call them my younger, brother, my younger brothers. Because all of them are contributing their quota towards that. But I want to respond to Honorable Samuel Ujato's issue. You see, first, every polling station has to be registered. And I, if you follow my previous engagement, I've said that some polling stations uh, have 32 voters, but we still assign them one kit to mm -hmm. register. Because once we have said that those would eat, eat and something are going to work for six days, somebody who has 32 also think that he also has six days. So if you want to reduce the number, the person who go on the six days is not there. So every police station will have the six days. But you have mobile teams. And these mobile teams are supposed to be operated from the district offices. So when they identify that a place is overcrowded, then this mobile team will go in to help clear them. And so I call them sweeper. So whenever there's a few looking at the place, the people will move in. But I think the major challenge that we are getting is that people are not patient enough to wait for their time. Clustering means that a team is moving from one center to the another, to another, to another. So if it has not gotten to our level, for example, we are now operating at Honorable Okujeto's center. Uh, Samir Oku should also know that it will come to his left uh, his, uh, center. Okay. So people from Samir Oku's place should not go to Anabu Oku Jato's place. Because if you go by our computations, we are expecting the maximum registered polling station to be not less than 850. That's why those which have been split, you know, based on the record that we have, any polling station that has more than 850 has been split into two, and see, we consider them as different police stations, and we, have, we are going to assign kids to each of them. So if people who have patience and wait, that from Anna Bokuja to police station, Sami Okuja to police station, Sami Okuja Center will be the next, then we'll be able to capture. But do they have, do they have this information? Do they have this information about when uh, the, the, the EC team will be coming to their specific locations. Do they have that? How readily available is yes, that? We, 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 we have, we, I don't know if you have gone to the figure, we have pasted what we call notice of movement plan. Mm. So every police station, you have these notices pasted with the date written on them. So you would but have to necessarily go to the center before you see that. You would have to go to the center to see yeah, that. But you yeah, have a system yeah, where people yeah, don't necessarily you, have to go from, to the center to see it. Mondays, Check for, check for Monday's graphic. We have been publishing the first phase. Mm. If you, if you, if you, if you, if, if, and we have the mobile vans which are also announcing. Mm. Then we have other means of other people to communicate. So we are doing all these things. Mm. But the issue is that some of them, when you confront them, what they say is that they don't want to take chances. Maybe by the time to get to the uh, uh, center, we have computers and no people mm -hmm. who have the sixes, no matter the number of people. So that is the first thing. And because of that, there's the second batch that we are starting for Monday. We are increasing the numbers of the police stations. Then we are increasing the number of mobile teams. So that whenever there's a crime, because if you take the number that I'm talking of, if you say that the center is supposed to register 900, and then there's the, the kids are able to register average of 150, so automatically you cover 900. Well. And when you realize that you are not, then the mobile team can come in. So mm. I only appeal to Kenyans that don't move from your police station to the other. Because the implication is that once you have you have, you have been voting at Anna Bokujetu's center and you are now going to visit Samia Oku's center, you have lost the, the original police station. Mm. We will not allow you to transfer your vote from 
I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I I a certain locality. Right. And should be with, we should be residing in that locality before you can register. Mm. But people overlook it because people know themselves. So please and please, everybody should wait. By all means, we'll get to any polling station in Ghana. Mm. We have 33,367. Every polling station will have to stand for registration. Very so well. Once we are able to stick to our original polling stations, some of these congestion too can also be reduced. Very well. I believe it would. Uh, it has to take uh, some more of education there for uh, the, pers the persons who are eager to vote or register to get that picture. We'll take a break here. When we come back, we will interrogate more the issues bordering uh, the voter registration exercise, uh, particularly looking at the deployment of security personnel. We'll see you after this break. This is a key point. Stay with us. Welcome back. So this is still the key point and we're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page TV3 Ghana. So we are having a conversation via Zoom with Dr. Sribo Kweku, um, Honorable Kujatoa Blakwa and Sami Iwuku regarding the voter registration exercise which commenced on the 30th of June 2020, which is currently in its fifth day. Uh, before I go back to my panelists, let's take um, a story concerning um, the EC and the voter registration exercise where the EC was addressing issues about registration. Um, so it's a report where the EC was um, addressing issues about registration centers being cited um, on school campuses. Let's take a listen to the EC chairperson and we will quickly go on to Zoom with our panelists. President Ekufuado, in his 13th address to the nation, noted that the use of school premises by outsiders for religious and other activities would not be allowed as schools reopened for final year junior high school students. Use by outsiders of school premises for religious and other activities will not be allowed. Chair of the Electoral Commission, Jean Mensa, also in her address on Monday, June 29, said the EC will not set camp inside school buildings. Where schools, churches and other such venues are used as registration centers, will not set camp inside the school or church buildings. Our registration centers will be set up in open fields and open spaces outside the school and church buildings. At the start of the exercise, final year junior high school students of the Bebeise Basic School had to go through this crowd before entering their school compound. Yes, when we returned, registration was ongoing at the school's premises at the Pentecostal Academy, Ebenezer Senior High, Edley International and other schools visited in the constituency, the situation was same. We are only here to advise for them to observe social distancing and whether other PPEs have been supplied. We advise them what to do so that they observe all the protocols. They have an alternative gate here. We ask them to open the alternative gate and then let them pass there. Look at Right, so that was the report there uh, where the EC had assured prior to the commencement of the exercise that the EC wouldn't set camp on uh, premises of schools. Indeed, the president also did uh, give that assurance in his address to the nation regarding COVID-19. Now, Dr. Shribo, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Very well. So uh, this issue about EC setting camp on um, school premises uh, it has become an issue where students now have to queue and have access uh, to have access to their classrooms and all. What, what, what happened? Could you um, elaborate on that? Because prior to the commencement, we were uh, given assurance that that wouldn't happen. Thank you very much. First, we should establish that some of these schools are 
polling stations or registration centers. So what we are expecting is that the people will not go into the classrooms and the rest. But a place within the premises should be found for them. Because once they are the polling stations that have been gazetted, you cannot take the polling station completely far away from them. So then what, so what informed the EC should, chairperson's should. statement that that wouldn't happen, that the EC wouldn't set camp there? Because that was quite categorical, and the president uh, as well. Think, yes, that means that we should not go into the classrooms but it should be positioned in such a way that it will not interfere with the running of the schools. So if it is within the compound, it should be positioned in such a way that the flow of school activities and the rest will not be disrupted. So are you but saying that set camp means set, re, set, set up registration centers in the classrooms and not on the premises? No, no because I'm saying that if the, that, that the, would be the a bit of is, a challenge. A, because if, if the school is a police station, that we should find a place that will site is maybe outside the school walls, wherever. But you cannot take it completely from the premises because in that case you are closing that the police station or the station center. But 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 so again, sorry to no. sorry to sorry to be cutting you, but I, I believe we need to um, establish certain points. We are not in ordinary times. I think that has been established a long time ago. And so um, perhaps in going ahead with this registration, we should have factored in that as well to ensure that we don't put the lives of these students at risk. Because you're trying to limit access and co large congregations. But here we are, students now have to contend with uh, persons who troop to vote the registration centers uh, with a view to get registered. Shouldn't there have been some modifications regarding these um, registration centers? Yes, they may have been gazetted already, but given that we are not in ordinary times, shouldn't we have had a second look at these um, registration centers? That is exactly what I was saying, that you position the center such a way that it does not disturb the flow and activities of the school, but you cannot completely take them away. Because once it is the registration center, you position it either outside the compound or the place such that it will not disturb the flow and activities of the school. Mm -hmm. Even the noise alone may affect the uh, school's uh, teaching and the rest. Mm -hmm. But you cannot take them far away from the center because that's the police station. Even but, those schools which are not receiving centers, those which are not receiving centers, we are planning to uh, go there to register them because by the protocols, they are not supposed to be going out of town to register. So where even where there are no, uh, uh, there are not politicians, we have to find we are going to register them. But the most important thing is that you position yourself in a way that you will not disturb the activities of the school. And uh, the students should not be having contact with the so what would you say to people who are saying that then perhaps the EC chairperson and the president went, when they were speaking uh, would have you know, adverted their minds to this situation? Because what we heard and what is happening are totally at variance. It, 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 would, it would appear as though the facts that you have, which informs your submissions, uh, were not available to uh, the president and the EC chairperson when they made those respective statements. No, I, well, I don't think they said that we should not be there at all. They said well, they wouldn't set camp is a, is a on center. the campuses. That's what I'm saying. So you locate yourself at a place that was accessible to those who are going to register for that particular police station. But you cannot say that you will not be around because if uh, uh, TV3 premises is a police station, they can say that you are going to collapse that center. But you position the center in a way that TV3 can do its work. It would not bring about contact between the TV3 staff and uh, people who are applying to register. But you cannot collapse the police station completely. Mm, very well. Let me bring in um, Honorable Okuja to our and uh, on this issue as well, because uh, we have had, even the, I think one of the teacher unions has had cause to complain about the situation. Um, Dr. Shribo Kwaku is making a point that, yes, these centers have already been gazetted, so you just can't um, get up one morning and decide that you're not going to go on. But we, we did hear the statements uh, by the EC chairperson uh, and the president, as a matter of fact, saying that registration centers would not be set up on campuses of schools. Your thoughts? I mean, clearly one of those situations where the reality on the ground is inconsistent with the uh, rhetoric in terms of the policy uh, directives. Um, I mean, I have been to a good number of polling stations even outside my constituency and all the polling stations in my constituency. 
I can tell you that so many registration centers are in schools, right in schools. When Dr. Srebwa uh, Kwaku says that classrooms are not being used, I have observed that they are being used, right, you know, uh, and you in the media, uh, the TV3 report is very accurate. And you know why they are being used? The devices record. Hello? Okay, so we, yeah, we're, we're having a problem battery, with, okay, carry on. So that, so, so that the battery can be charged. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can, carry on. They, they yes. need access yes. to so, um, electricity yes. points, right? Access to electricity points. And in most of those schools, the electricity points are in classrooms. Mm. So it's not the case that, you know, we are using the school premises, but far removed. We are, we are probably on a field, on a football park. There will be no access to power. Uh, they, they have not made uh, arrangements for that kind of scenario. So they are forced to use classrooms or to even be so close to multiple classrooms so as to virtually uh, put students at risk. And it's one of the, 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 the concerns that I am deeply, deeply worried about. Mm. Then there are other two matters that I want to raise quickly. Yeah, quickly. The, the, first, the first relates to the busing and mass. There are reports from all over the country. Um, from Hohoi to uh, Ayawasu West Wagon to Asawasi to Kaswa. What is the policy? Are people allowed to be bus and mass outside their constituencies to, um, I, I, as it were, be brought into constituencies that they do not live in so as to, and, and, and you know, this really affects the parliamentary elections you are going to have a situation where if care is not taken, people who don't live in the constituency at all, who don't know what is happening in the constituency, will be determining the political destiny mm. of these constituencies. It can also lead to gerrymandering. So I am, I am, I am frightened about what I'm seeing. The, the mass pass from one location to the other, people are moving their supporters so as to influence, especially in constituencies where they have seen that there are marginal constituencies. Uh, party A or Party B can win. And so uh, let's see the, how we can import potential voters to tilt the scale in our favor. The EC must pay attention to that and we must have a clear policy direction. Is that allowed? Uh, and I don't want to believe that this kind of gerrymandering and underhand tactics that will distort the true outcome of people who live in constituencies uh, is acceptable. Now, Honorable, the other concern, you're, you're, the making, other you're making, you're making, security. Honorable, security. Just, just a minute. On the issue about busing, um, could you say exactly who is busing? Is it a case that it's across the board that political parties are engaged in that or that a particular group is doing this? If you could substantiate um, or elaborate on, 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 on that um, statement you made. Yet, to give you specific instances, in the case of uh, Hohoi, for example, our parliamentary candidate, Professor Margaret Kweku, uh, uh, has accused her opponent of bashing people, uh, and, and that's the, the Honorable Minister for, 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 for Energy, the Honorable Amehu, that's the allegation. Uh, in Ayawasu West Wagon, uh, our constituency chairman, is also accusing the parliamentary candidate for passing people and, and, and bringing them in droves. So these are uh, things you've heard from other people. You, you haven't in, necessarily... In Asawasi, it's reported in the media. These have been widely reported. In the media. Okay. Asawasi, Asawasi is another example. In the case of Asawasi, uh, to be objective, there are counter uh, accusations. Mm -hmm. uh, the Honorable Muntaka is accusing the MC for passing and and vice versa. The MC is also accusing mm -hmm. Honorable Muntaka. So it's this whole passing of, uh, if I will use, uh, non-constituents, mm -hmm. uh, people who do not live in the constituency, is becoming mm -hmm. a major, major issue. If mm -hmm. care is not taken, it could derail the process. Mm -hmm. The other matter relates to security. Uh, I would have thought that the security agencies 
have been deployed to maintain law and order. Should there be room for macho men? I do not think so. We have seen reports, media reports, quite on a wide scale. Look at what happened in Kaswa a couple of days ago, where macho men are seen in the convoy of uh, a particular MP. They fire gunshots and all of that, scaring, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the potential voters away and, and, and undermining peace and stability. Mm. The, the Electoral Commission must be heard on that. Very what well. is the, the policy about security? Are candidates, parliamentary mm -hmm. candidates, allowed to bring their own security to, to, to polling stations? And are that, people allowed honorable, to Honorable, I think you know the answer to that. Definitely that, that, that will not be the case. The EC provides security I'm for I'm that. Not, so I'm anything. But let me bring to, Mr. Um, Mr. Samuel Kuhn. I also have to come in. Of yes. course, you are here. Um, I, I, I have okay. put you up now. Yes, your thoughts on that. Okay. Honorable talks about the well, issue about busing and all other things. Your reactions? I, I, I think respectfully, my, my, my good friend and, uh, uh, and great friend of all times is, is, is being selective in, in his choice of examples and approach. Um, as we speak, we've had NDC members or alleged members of the NDC in the Asawasa constituency who have been arrested uh, for possessing registration materials illegally. Again, in some constituencies as well, we've had reports, and our people have also complained of people being bashed from one point to the other. They are laid down procedures. If you believe that someone does not qualify to be on the electoral roll, the same CI that was passed by, by Parliament, of which my good friend is a member of Parliament, says you can fill a challenge form. That's why they are laid down procedures and rules. And so I will go against any political party, being it <coughs> NDC or NPP, who will try to circumvent these laid down procedures and, and subscribe to the use of force, as also articulated by the national organizer on an Accra based radio station a couple of days ago, that there are people should resist physically, people that they be uh, not fit to be on the electoral roll or do not reside. The, the provisions are clear in the CI. One, if you have suspicion that this person is not a Ghanaian, it's a minor, the person doesn't reside there, ordinarily resident there, and all that, you can challenge the person. If you challenge the person, the person will not be issued with a voter's ID. And so I think that if you go through the motions well, the person who will have his time to appear before a district review committee to make a case for himself or herself. Again, we have also received widespread report of people who are being who are being arrested left right center trying to cross Ghana's borders you know left and right and uh, as i speak to you today we have pictures and report of people who had crossed from the ghana togo border to register in the account constituents and they saying that the ndc executives they alleged ask them to come register so if you want to go by many of these allegations as well then it's going to be uh, a back and forth argument. What I think we should do as a people, and my suggestion and that of the MPP's position is that where you have serious grounds, you can challenge. And these are provisions clearly laid down in the, in the CI mm. as far as by Parliament. Mm. And again, last but not the least, on the issue of the Ayawasu West Open, it's strange that the NDC to you know, I listened to their parliamentary candidates not too long ago, uh, uh, in an interview he granted uh, City News or City TV, saying that the NDC uh, doesn't really subscribe to intellectuals. And then he had to go on and on trying to refine it here and there. Then you had, I had the NDC's constituency chairman saying that our member of parliament, Madam Lydia Sarah Malassan, is also passing people in people who are not intellectuals. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes in effect as to which position to take when it comes to the NDC's position, the Ayahuasca West. Sami and I, we've been strong activists in the Ayahuasca West movement for years. He has a huge base. The Honorable Oku Jetop Lava has a huge base in that constituency. So do I also have a huge base because we've been activists there. And if you look at the, the demographics of the Ayahuasca West, you have students who are on campus. They register there, they are on vacation. Can these people not come there and register? Because ordinarily, had it not been this COVID, they were supposed to be in school. You have several educational facilities in the Ayawasu West Wokong. Mm. So the person can be hailing from Hohoi or in Zabzibu. 
but the person is a student in that constituency. So you're saying so that that person is being facilitated yeah. to come to uh, get registered. Is that what you're saying? Both, both, party, both parties are doing that. And I can confidently tell you that the John Dumendo camp, they've been calling students. So has Lydia Sira Malas been doing. I can confidently tell you. I have friends, I have cousins who have been called by both parties that it's time to register. If you can please come, come and register. So the person receives a call from Lydia's camp, receives their call from John Dumelo's camp. So when you say people are being... So both parties are, are engaged in, in getting people to come and register. That's what you're saying. And, 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 that is, especially in, in circumstances where you have educational institutions in some of these constituencies. Very well. If you tell the SOS constituency, as Muntaka is Muntaka alleged that the MPP had backed people uh, from other constituencies to Asawasi. Asawasi has very interesting dynamics. You can be around the Bokum area of Menshia North and also very close to the Asawasi constituency. If you take the Asokore Mampur route, you still is interwoven into the constituency itself of the Asawasi constituency. So it's, it's a bit technical, but I think that we should not too much uh, play the, the blame game. However, if we have strong reservations, I've been going around, and I keep educating Very well. our people. Your point is, are reasonable your point is well made. The CI and the provision Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sribokweku, let me come back to you here. And let's touch on the um, news reports that we have about arrests of some party agents um, who were caught with um, registration forms. Um, can you confirm that? And what... What does that mean for the whole uh, security apparatus, if you like, regarding uh, the restrictions around such material? Uh, um, Madam Host, please read your name. Abna. Okay, Host. Abna, I think clearly from what my two. I think Abna, yeah, the, the, two the two summits are saying, mm -hmm. you can identify where the problem is. If the political parties who play the game according to the rules will not have any problem. So instead of accusation and counter accusations, they all know the rules govern our activities. They should play the game fairly and nobody will have any problem. Now, with respect to the issue of somebody having been arrested with the forms, mm -hmm. military, you mentioned it, I called my regional director for Ashanti. What he said is that some people have printed more or less a questionnaire that answers the, uh, answers the question that will be asked at the registration center. So the one they, when they, they, you, 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 they, you, they meet you, they will give it to you so that you complete those questionnaires with respect to your name, mother's name, father's name, all the possible questions on the Form 1A. If that is the case, then I don't think there's any harm. They are not our materials. So that is, I'm speaking as told by the regional director. So that's what he said. But we are using from grantee forms and from 1C. The form 1A is the one that we use to extract information from you with respect to the particular that we will need. Then the guarantee form is what you will use to guarantee if you don't have the source document. And the form 1C is what is generated as a printout from the machine. That part of it will be detached and prepare your ID card for you. So these are the forms that we are using. If you hold any of them, mm. it is an illegality. But we have gone further and uploaded the 1A and the 1C. So if you are an applicant and you have downloaded one and completed, you have not committed any offense. But you have, if you are seen with more than one, then there's a problem. Because the law is clear that you cannot be holding documents of the letter commission without permission. So, so we are permitting everybody to hold one from 1A that should be for him who have been completed. Mm. And from one C, if the person doesn't have the source though, if you're holding one, one each, you don't have, you have not committed an offense. Very well. So now, the one. if you could confirm, the person who was arrested in the Asawasi area, what, which, which, which forms uh, did they have? Do you have that, that information? From, from, from what my original data is telling me, it is a questionnaire, not our form. Okay, so they can have that, is that what you're saying? That no, you don't have to rub the, they have to rub their own questionnaire okay. to answer the questions that we ask at the retention center. Mm. So if it if that is the case, then no 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 breach has been okay. 
Very, very well. Now we will be asked, I'll come back to you, Dr. Sribo, but before that, let's take a listen to uh, the minority leader uh, in parliament where uh, the, the, the minority in parliament held a press conference yesterday addressing uh, challenges with the voter registration exercise and made some uh, comments that I would want um, Dr. Sribo Kweku to respond to. Let's take a listen to um, the Honorable Haruna Idrisu. Public Elections Regulations 2020, which has just been laid by the Majority Leader on behalf of the Independent Electoral Commission established under Article 45. My reading of it gives me much to be concerned about and to state authoritatively without fear of contradiction, that the 2020 presidential and parliamentary elections of Ghana is likely to be run on a provisional voter register and not a certified final register. Because in the definition column of the newly introduced regulations, the public elections regulations which replaces CI 94, registered voter in it is defined as, and I quote, means a person whose name appears on the provisional voters register. The new constitutional instrument currently before the House has been amended to cater for the transfer of vote. The constitutional instrument CI will regulate the December polls at the presentation of the business statement in the House on Friday. Members of the House called on the Speaker to summon the Electoral Commission before the Committee of the Whole to respond to questions they deem necessary. The Speaker was swift in his directive. And I wish to direct so that this matter will not become a matter of any discussion whatsoever again that two weeks after the situation exercise has come to an end, the Electoral Commission must send relevant representatives or representatives to this honorable house and give the house a briefing. Whilst the controversy over the conduct of the elections continues unabated, the Constitutional and Legal Committee of Parliament says the elections will not be conducted using a provisional register. The fact that the register is provisional doesn't derogate from the mandate or the power of the person to vote. Now, after the provisional register, there is also the graduation of the provisional register being termed as satisfied. That's where all the necessary corrections that have to be made have been made and the EC is certain or satisfied that there is no more anomaly or mistake associated with the provisional register. Meanwhile, the House will commence seatings on Monday until the House rises in August. Right, so you saw uh, Honourable um, Harina Idrisu there uh, address the press um, there. Also, the response in respect of the statement by Honourable Harina Idrisu by um, Honourable Ben Abdullah, who is the chairperson of the League Constitutional and Legal Committee of Parliament. Now, Dr. Sribo Kwaku, can you Kweku, hear me? Kweku, sorry. Kweku, Kweku. Dr. Sribo. So yes. you had um, the minority leader saying that uh, looking at the circumstances we have currently, we are likely to go into the 2020 polls on a provisional register. Your reaction to that? Uh, uh, is that Abraham, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I've not paid attention to the CI that has been sent to Parliament with respect to the definition there. And I was talking of, mm -hmm. but I know the commission is going to respond to his uh, statement or do I call it allegation, whatever. But what the, rec the document I have with me, I think we have already started sharing our program of activities from now to December 7th. I know that the provisional register will be the one that will be sent to the polling station for exhibition. 
immediately after exhibition, the applications with respect to inclusions, objections, and corrections will be effected. And this register will be certified by the district vice officer, who, who happen to be the district court at the judge of magistrate. But once they are certified, then there are no more provisional voters registered. The document I have with me, we are going to give the political parties the final registers by 6th of November, at least one month to the election. So I don't know where the provisional register will be there to be used. But I want to do some small education. I've already said that the commission will uh, respond to that. When we talk of the register, we have only one register for Ghana. But for the sake of administrative issues, that we have, we bring them to polling stations and what have you. So once you compare the register and certify, it's a register. But there can be movement in between. Uh, people will go for apply for transfers. People apply for prosy. People apply for uh, uh, special voting. The rest, but it's the same register. But you talk of movement. Maybe one once you um, by law, well, one one people can apply for register not less than twelve months, not less than the two days of election. So one that happens means that well, the person can move from point A to point B, but still within the same register. People who are going to vote for special voting, they will apply not the for the two days. You compile those register, you remove them from the police station list, but they still within the same register. So I can assure anybody who thinks I like like the honourable minority that we are not going to go into the election with the provisional register. It will only be provisional up to the point that exhibition is completed and the certified one certified is no more a provisional register. Very well. Uh, I would say a big thank you to you, Dr. Subo Kweku, uh, Director of Electoral Services at the Electoral Commission, and we're grateful for your time. Now, we'll move on with um, the two uh, politicians, and we'll carry on here. Um, Mr. Samia Wuku, we, um, I'll, yes, I can give you just a minute before we take a break. Um, any reactions to the statement by um, 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 the minority leader? Well, um, just as uh, the Electoral Commission said, we also await uh, a response. And then for us as a party, we can also look into it and also uh, appropriately respond to it. Mm. Very well. We will need to take a break at this point. When we come back, we will now go and interrogate the uh, deployment of uh, military persons at the border towns, which uh, the NDC has had cause to complain about, uh, which government maintains that it is a prudent action that is being taken just to safeguard uh, the integrity of the voters' role when eventually compiled. So we'll take a break. When we come back, we'll look at that particular issue. This is a... Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we have still on Zoom, uh, Mr. Samir Wuku, national organizer of the New Patriotic Party, and Honorable Samuel Okujetua Blakwa, the MP for North Tongu, and also a ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in Parliament. Now we're moving on next to um, Honorable we're looking at the deployment of uh, soldiers or military persons at uh, border towns, and I believe your constituency falls within one of such areas. And the NDC has had cause to complain, and the position of your party is that this, you've actually um, described it as a siege uh, uh, on, on, on those areas. But government maintains that it is not to intimidate persons um, in the communities, but it is to protect our borders so that we are able to control, you know, persons or restrain persons from coming into our jurisdiction to get illegally onto our voter register. I believe that shouldn't be a problem, should it? So what exactly are you opposed to or <coughs> objecting to? Well, thank you, Abna. Two issues to quickly clarify. First, my constituency in North Town is not affected. It's not a border constituency. And so we are not affected. Secondly, the claim you make as government's explanation, it must be placed on record that that explanation came from the Honorable KT Hammond, who is on the majority side. 
what government has been saying officially, uh, as put out by the defense minister, the regional minister, and the municipal chief executive, is to the effect that this is not related to the elections, that the military deployment is to prevent the further importation of COVID-19 uh, from Togo, and that since our borders were closed, uh, uh, to prevent the further importation of the virus, they have thought it necessary to now beef up uh, security at our border point. Now, to the extent that uh, you in the media uh, appear even confused, is the same way our chiefs, members of parliament, um, on We seem to be having a challenge with that connection. Accounts, okay, carry on. With the, with the conflicting account that is emanating from uh, our opponents. The point must be made that we need to run this country transparently, with sincerity. There ought not to be discrimination. There ought not to be intimidation. We should pursue the affairs of state with all the candor as our constitution requires, so far as uh, being fair to all manner of persons, which is the oath of office, His Excellency the President swore on the 7th of January 2017. We have said that this deployment, which was done virtually under the cover of darkness. Because we have been aware of other deployments when it came to Operation uh, Conquer Feast, for example. We were briefed as members of parliament uh, that related to the terrorist threat from Burkina Faso and the deployment that happened in the northern frontiers. We were briefed. We were not kept in the dark. It was not, it was not, um, a deployment that attracted conflicting accounts. When you come to this deployment in the Volta region, first of all, when the borders were closed uh, following the measures to fight COVID-19, it was an immigration-led closure that, as is required by our laws. They are in charge of maintaining our territorial integrity and protecting the borders. Now, when you want to deploy the military, it means that there's some escalated threat. It means that you really are, uh, 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 as it were, escalating. Now, you should ensure that that deployment is done transparently and is done fairly. We have not seen that. You, this deployment is a very recent deployment we have been to the ground, when I say we, the minority in parliament, following the uh, protests from our okay. chiefs, the queen mothers, youth groups, and constitu constituents, you know, people living in these border towns. So we followed up. And Honorable, sorry to cut you, but as indicated, we don't have much time. And so I would want you to go in particularly on the issue that you have with this aside the you that are is, alleging that it wasn't that is, transparent so beyond that what is that it is, about it that you have issues with beyond the transparency with which you have alleged when we met with superintendent dodo who is in charge of immigration at the aflao border he made it clear that this military deployment their commander reported to him on the 18th of June, very recently, which is contrary to claims by government that this was a long-time deployment related to fighting COVID-19. So the point we are making is that KT Hammond let the cut out of the bag when he said that, look, this was related to uh, preventing foreigners or Togolese from coming into our country to vote. I must state for the record that we in the NDC will not encourage any scheme mm -hmm. that will allow foreigners to come and determine our political right. destiny. So assuming we without admitting won, that what won. Honorable Katie Hammond said is, I mean, what motivated the deployment, what issue do you have with it? That contradicts 
government initial position, what the interior minister has said, what the defense minister has said, what the regional sure. minister has said. It, it contradicts that. And it tells you that there is some sinister agenda. There is some ulterior well. motive. And that's why government cannot be transparent. Thank you. The I believe that point, point that is made. made. Let me the move on quickly. Point, Honorable, the, I would the, have to move on to Samir no, Wukuna no, because our important. time is running out. The deployment... Our time is running yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Our time is Our running out. Let me, let me bring in Sami. Sorry. border is not the only border. We checked with the Western that, frontier. That's fine, Honorable. There was no such deployment. Honorable, thank you very much. I have Sami on now. So please, Sami, um, uh, as indicated, just a few minutes uh, to go. So please, uh, well, your reaction. Uh, uh, Honorable is saying uh, that governments appears uh, to be uh, inconsistent. Uh, uh, and that suggests a certain sinister um, agenda. Your reaction. Abna, I, I, it's unfortunate that you've allocated the, all the 10 minutes to the Honorable Member of Parliament, and I'm sure you're only going to give me a few seconds. It's not, I didn't allocate the 10 minutes. It's not 10 minutes. I'm, yeah, I've been keeping time. He started Karen. talking from 8, from 8, uh, 40. I've been keeping uh, time. It's unfortunate. Anyway, um, let me go straight to the point. I, I, I think the NDC, they've been clearly inconsistent on this matter of deployment. The Honorable Defence Minister, who is also a Member of Parliament, uh, with, uh, with with the minority also in parliament, gave a breakdown of Ghana's deployment of troops across the country. And the NDC's assertion uh, that indeed this deployment is even affecting the number of people who could register uh, in their strongholds, which is the Volta region, is a bit strange. We have 18 constituencies in the Volta region, as we speak. And now, as at the end of day, day four, day three, um, they have almost 80,000 people registering across the Volta region. And this defeats the very assertion that this is a scheme to help prevent people from registering. Again, I can also confidently tell you that if you check our borders, our northern borders in Burkina Faso, you have troops deployed there as the defense minister give the breakdown. If you check our western borders, it's the same. If you check Ghana's border with Togo, my, I, am, I am a bit at a loss. Because before the lockdown, um, Ghana also secured these borders. And we've had several examples of people who have been arrested in the northern Ghana, in the water part of our country, in the western part of our country, from trying to smuggle in or get themselves into Ghana's territory. And many of these people who have also entered illegally when tested, tested positive for the deadly novel coronavirus. And you, TV3 yourself, you reported examples of some of these incidents. So what is wrong if Ghana also at a crucial time of registration exercise also decides that, look, because it's a national exercise also ongoing, there will be a tendency for people who try to also come into Ghana illegally from Burkina Faso, from Togo, from Ivory Coast. Because in any case, your borders are closed. So anybody coming in must have express permission from the authorities of our state. But what the and NDC suggests is that the government's position appears to be inconsistent, okay. whereas there's one uh, by yeah, the defense well, minister, well, and then you have Honorable Katie Hammond saying that. So that's what the Katie, they are the Honorable suggesting Katie then. Hammond, mm -hmm. The Honorable Katie Hammond doesn't speak on defense when it comes to uh, defense matters. So that statement should be disregarded. I'm not saying disregard, but I'm saying that the authority to speak to that matter is the defense minister. And he has articulated these matters clearly in, within the media space. All I'm saying is that if me, Samir, I cross into Burkina Faso now, when their borders are closed, I'll be deemed to have entered illegally. And so is my brother, the Honorable Samuel Okudia Park. Unless, because it's registration time, all rules of engagement should be disregarded. Ghana's airspace, whether it's closed or not, our land borders, whether it's closed or not, should be a free for all. I think that will be driving towards a state of lawlessness. Mm. The greatest of Very well. Um, unfortunately, we are not able to comment on the tussle between the Auditor General's office and uh, the office of the president because we have very limited time here. We need to round up the conversation here and get on to look at our fight against COVID-19. But let me say a big thank you to the Honorable uh, Samuel Okuja, to Ablakwa MP for North Tongu, and also a ranking member of the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs, and Mr. Sami Ebuku, the national organizer of the New Patriotic Party. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll take a break. When we come back, we uh, and panel the experts to look at the COVID-19 fight in Ghana. See you shortly.
Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So moving on, we're going to be looking at our fight against COVID-19. How are we doing? Are we losing the fight or are we uh, winning that fight? And uh, via Zoom now, we have um, Dr. Titus Bayou. He is uh, the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, GMA. And also we have Professor Fred Binker. He is a professor of epidemiology. And we are grateful for your time, Prof and Dr. Bayou. Now, I was, let me start with you, Dr. Bayou, because um, this week the Ghana Medical Association has uh, been making a number of statements. And you have had cause to you know, uh, caution um, the, the, the way the registration exercise, for instance, has been conducted, social distancing being thrown to the dogs when it comes to uh, the people who congregate at the various um, registration centers and all of that. Uh, let's, let, let, let's hear from you how you think we can be improving or how we can improve on that situation, trying to deal with the numbers at uh, the various registration centers because obviously our numbers are surging and if the science is anything to go by when we breach these violations key amongst them being social distancing then obviously we're putting ourselves in a very dangerous position particularly when people are not even wearing the face masks as they should all right thank you very much uh, for having me and good morning to prof uh, my very senior colleague um, I would first of all say that uh, we are in very difficult times and the GMA has made some few things very clear. And I would start by saying that people, uh, especially people with the electoral commission and a few others have not agreed with some of our positions. But before I make suggestions on how they could do things better, we want to maintain that the convener of any gathering must be held ultimately liable for what happens at that gathering. Mm. And as far as the GMA is concerned, the Electoral Commission is carrying out a legitimate exercise. We don't contest that. But the Electoral Commission must ensure that wherever they assemble people for this exercise, the rules of the land apply and that there is safety for the general public who come there. So to that extent, any violation of um, the executive instrument and the policies that we have put in place to prevent this spread must fall squarely with the commission. And it is not something they can push that responsibility to anybody else. Individuals have personal responsibilities to take, admitted. But if you do not convene those people into a single gathering, whatever risk is associated with that gathering will not exist. So you cannot hide under uh, um, personal protection and say that we should ask people to be responsible and not the commission. And the commission has ways by which it can ensure that people respect the laws. And this is where I'll bring in the suggestions on how we can make things better. That uh, the commission, for instance, could decide that at these registration centers, Anybody who comes there and is not obeying their protocols will be sent home. What we have observed in our monitoring is that you will find if they are doing in a gated premises, within the gated premises, there will be the sitting arrangement and everything will obey the social distancing. Outside of that gated premises will then be a mass of people struggling to get in with no semblance of social distancing, which we think is unfortunate. You cannot pretend to control what is within the premises and ignore what is outside. In some instances, even within the premises, people are queuing and disregarding social distancing completely. We think that the EC must be more responsible and must take decisions. For instance, could they decide that if a particular pooling center, they are unable to control um, the, the, the crowd, they will close up that place and ask the people to go home and come another time so that people realize that they are serious. Could they use an allocation system 
where if they come in, they will allocate people numbers. If they think they can register 100 people, after the 100 is exceeded, they could close up and ask the rest to go home and come the next day. We cannot keep things as usual. Mm. And the rising numbers we are seeing, definitely we need explanations. And I'm sure when we get there, uh, we will prefer some solutions. Very well. Thank you so for... This to be my initial take on the commission. Very well. We do appreciate that. Uh, thanks for those initial uh, comments. Let me do announce quickly that we have joining us also Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaje. He is the uh, Director General of the Ghana Health Service. Uh, thanks, Doc. Uh, we appreciate your time. Now, Prof, let me come to you. Our numbers are surging. Last week we discussed this. Uh, as of yesterday, the 3rd of July, 2020, our case counts stands at 18,134, with some 13,550 recoveries, uh, which now is to be looked at as, as discharges, not necessarily fully recovered cases, but discharged based on the uh, new guidelines that uh, we are uh, going with. And we have 117 deaths as, as of yesterday, July 3rd, 2020. Now, as an epidemiologist sitting uh, you know, back, looking at what's happening with our registration process and the lack of social distancing that's been observed across board, what runs through your head? Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to your listeners and good morning to my panelists, Dr. Bayou and Dr. Abwaji. Um, I can assure you that first, before I get to the data, let me endorse uh, what Dr. Bayou just said. The uh, problems we are facing with bringing people together cannot, cannot in public health be attributed to the population. It squarely lies in the bosom of the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission knows this and it should not be pretending. In fact, when it tries to shy away from taking responsibility, it's a, a real burden for all of us. We really feel very worried. And I'm happy that Dr. Bayou and his team are raising this issue because the effects of non complying with this is what we are seeing the data. Mm. The numbers are going to go up. This virus doesn't have a, a leg. We all have gone through many uh, problems to try and stop and slow it down. Once people come together, they will distribute the virus and then we shall have more numbers. So, I mean, th there's no again saying that we are generating and creating these problems. But most importantly, I think these days I'm not worried about the numbers more than looking at the lives. You are putting the health workers' lives at risk. We've said this from day one, that once the numbers go up, health workers' lives are at risk. First of all, they will get in contact with more and more people who have the disease they will get infected. Your chances of getting infected increase with the chances that you come uh, what, uh, in contact with the disease. And when most of them are down, the system will collapse. It, it, it's just uh, basic that if you see uh, five cases a day, your chances of getting infected is different from when you are seeing 100 cases mm. a day. And, and, and so the, they should take this uh, prompting by the uh, Ghana Medical Association very uh, uh, what, very seriously. Right. You are putting their members at harm and they are going to lose their members. And you, you are already saying that you are not in charge of that. So th that, that's my first uh, point. Secondly, look, these numbers are going to increase. What we are seeing today is still the tip of the iceberg. When I sit here and I look at the numbers, I look more at the numbers that have been tested. Our testing is going down. Just check the, 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 the situation reports that come from each of the regions. You see the numbers that have been uh, uh, what tested. So the more the asymptomatic people are being found, the more the number of cases are going to double. And please remember that we've said this year over and over again, the, the what increase is geometric increase. Mm. It's not uh, just uh, direct, you've infected one, so you infected the next one. No, it's a geometric increase. So if you have 100 today, they will infect another 100, and right. they will infect another 100, and so on. So these numbers are going to quadruple. We shall hit 50,000 in a very short time. Right. And we need to do something to slow it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, 
uh, we are not yet ready to start the sewing process because mm. we are bringing more people together. Sure. And uh, more people are going to share the virus. Right. Very well. Thank you for that. Indeed, uh, the figures have been updated. We have confirmed cases 19,388 and deaths 117. Recoveries or discharges uh, 14,330 and active cases 4,941. So just between uh, yesterday, the 3rd of July, and today, 4th of July, we've seen that increase from 18,134 to 19,388. That is a major, major spike there. Let me bring in Dr. Patrick Abouadjie. Director General of Ghana Health Service. Now, um, Doc, a very direct question. Sitting as a Director General of the Ghana Health Service and looking at the figures as they rise, how do you see that situation even as we're going through the voter registration exercise, which five days into the process has been fraught with uh, lots of violations regarding the COVID-19 protocols or if you like precautions uh, to stem the tide of spread. How do you, how, how, how comfortable are you with the situation as the Ghana Health Service Director General looking at the situation as against the numbers, the increase uh, in the numbers? <coughs> Good morning um, and thanks for the opportunity and greetings to my co-panelists. Prof and Titus, uh, and yourself. Yes, uh, I don't think anybody in Ghana is very happy or comfortable with the rising uh, numbers in quotes. Um, as we said, I have the, the, the current data which I just posted. Um, the numbers are going up. And if you just want to restrict yourself to the daily number, the daily numbers really doesn't represent a 24-hour mm -hmm. count. The current addition does not necessarily because of, unfortunately, the, the challenges we are having with uh, testing capacity and the speed of testing and people having to move samples from Upper West to Kumasi and etc. So if you look at what has been reported today, which has just been updated, mm -hmm. these are samples that were taken way back from the 16th of some of them, the samples were taken on the 16th of June, uh, all the way to the 29th of June. And that's wow. what's represented. And it's spread across that with a higher number, let's say on the 18th up to the 20th, that's what we have. And so, yes, we are not very comfortable with the numbers. But coming back to the social distancing compliance, and I think um, it will not be fair to just blame one organization uh, because the, 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 the fact that we are not complying with the wearing of the mask and the social distancing cut across, not just in voter registration, but in, in any system where it brings people together, are people complying? And I think that uh, as a country, we have to all work together. Whilst the public health system comes up with the protocols, the compliance of the people is extremely important. When they use the same system in Czech, Czech, Czech Republic and uh, then Korea and the West, it was not because the public service, uh, public sector or the, the health sector forced people to comply. The people voluntarily complied. And I think that's what we need to also um, talk about because any system whether you are queuing in a trotro whatever system we are doing that brings people together we will need to apply that and so if you just um, blame one organization alone currently we have an eye going on etc so we, we just have to be conscious about the fathers these are the real times we need to uh, apply the protocols whether at the workplace whether you are in a queue, whether you are, like I said the other time, whether you are queuing to go and buy a cuckoo or watch it, it's the same offense. The right, same but, 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 Doc. But I think that, we need to really look at that. Very well. But, but that's what the GMA is saying, that mm -hmm. to the extent that, yes, we're not in ordinary times, anybody mm -hmm. who takes it up upon themselves to convene people, you take that responsibility then. Yeah. So yeah, that, for know, instance... For the voter registration exercise now, the EC is the convener. And so to the extent that they are convening, that responsibility ultimately lies with them. And I would want to presume that the COCO example you gave, 
if a cocoa seller has set up her table and people are there, that responsibility ought to be on that cocoa seller to ensure that, well, to the extent that you come to me, you should be complying. I think that is a tenable argument, wouldn't you say so? Yes. I agree with you, but also cooperation is extremely important. I think that people are also willing. I have been to several uh, centers. That's why we have also put health workers to assist in education and working sure that these things are done. Sometimes we'll get there around 5 a.m. when uh, there's nobody there. And outside the perimeter of the screening, uh, the registration, and stuff, that's when you see the larger uh, infringement. So we have also explained uh, uh, contacted them and the security service that is it possible that even outside the perimeter where people are waiting to join queues can we do something i think it's a collective effort that all of us will have to to do so the best way to deal with this virus is for all of us to stay home just like Bob said, the, the virus doesn't have uh, a leg but then if you stay we all stay home something else will kill us one way or the other and so we need to really, uh, when we talk about learning to live with a virus, these are some of the tenets that we must all uh, look at. Yes, right. the Electoral Commission can do more, the security services who are assist them can do more. But I think the ultimate responsibility also lies, and we as a people must also take responsibility. Mm. Very well. That. Now let's look at the issue about testing. For our own life and that of others. Ultimately, definitely, we, we yes. have that responsibility individually. But let's look now at testing. Yes. And uh, testing has been an issue. The World Health Organization has, since the, com since the beginning of this pandemic, talked about the fact that testing is the way to go. Testing, testing, testing is their mantra. Now, we, at some point, Ghana, were able to clear the backlog of samples that we had. It appears we've gone back to the system where we still have backlogs. Question then is, yeah. How, how can I, I mean, what should I make of a result I get from a test that is conducted two weeks or three weeks ago, if I get it today, and particularly looking at the kind of virus we're dealing with, a very insidious virus, very, I mean, easy to transmit. So if I get my results three weeks after I test, I, I, literally, I can't go to the bank with such a result. So it makes the testing that I did redundant. So how are we yeah. ensuring that the resources we put into the testing yields the results we seek? Because otherwise, the cost of running the test on a single person at the end of the day is, is useless. And it, it, it ends up making testing very ridiculous in the circumstances. So what are we doing about that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that is quite unfortunate, and we have admitted the huge challenge that we are having uh, as far as that is concerned. I think we mentioned on Thursday that we've had a global challenge with getting the necessary logistics uh, for that. So even though we have had created 10 centers, uh, we are working probably at a lower capacity because certain regions are not there, certain tests, even if you have the money, you cannot buy. Fortunately, it's a large consignment coming in this today, fourth. And so we hope that with the, that we should be able to quickly ramp up and gather. It's the question of this a global shortage. The whole world, WHO is testing, testing. Everybody, every country is rushing for the same commodity. Mm, very well. And uh, so sometimes okay. there's a global branch, and that's what we have. And so we working today, there's a large consignment coming in. And I'm sure from Monday going, we should be able to. Uh, keep up and really catch up and be able to do what we are supposed to. Like you said, these are not very normal times and mm. we are also very critical. Very but well. also one of the other challenges that we have had to stop was the frivolous testing of companies who want all their staff tested when there's really no risk. But why do, you, why do you call it frivolous, Doc? Why, if I may come in, why stopped. do you call it frivolous? Because this is a situation where we, we are saying there are more asymptomatic we, we persons. There are more asymptomatic I, cases. I, I, and so you don't necessarily know, have to show then, signs before then, you go. So then, why would it be frivolous? Stop. Wouldn't that be more then of then, a responsible then, act? No. Then the most possible thing is to test everybody which we cannot. And so that is why to 
pra, keep priority for people who are sick, people who are exposed, so that we don't have the backlog. And that's why we have a testing policy of those who have stress and organization that feels threatened. We come in, do a risk assessment, and then test the people who need to be tested. But to say we are 300, 500, test all of us. And then you have a yield of about maybe one or two percent. It also clogs the system. And that's why we're trying to see yeah. how do we clear some, because we don't really have all the resources. But because of that, we can't test everybody. And so we need to have a criteria that gives us the best. Uh, uh, results whilst we contain very well. the disease. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bayo, let me bring you back in. Okay, so we don't have resources to test everybody. And where people decide to, well, let's be responsible citizens, we don't know if we are positive because we do know that majority of cases are asymptomatic. So the fact that you're walking around um, not showing signs doesn't mean that you don't have a virus. Typical example is Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, Mr. Carlos Ahinkra, who you know, has had to resign his position because of the action he took. And so how do we reconcile that against this call for testing? Doc. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> let me say a good morning to Director General, since he joined a bit late. Um, the issue of testing, I can understand the difficulty of the health service. but I will say that it is something they have brought upon themselves. And I'm saying this because I don't think they have carried the population along very well. And some stakeholders, as far as this testing policy is concerned, when we all are practicing a policy and you face challenges, you come out, you let people know this is a challenge we have faced and therefore we are changing direction. We were having a policy initially where we're testing symptomatic people. Mm -hmm. We call for an increase in testing capacity and we increase the capacity. We decided to do enhanced surveillance and tested large numbers of people. We tested returnees and all of that we, because we had reagents. Now reagents are running out of supply. The GMA started prompting that we were recognizing that the testing capacity was reducing. And anytime we made a uh, comment on it, we're told everything is all right. We had promises that some centers were coming up, 15 centers with gene experts to add up, and nothing was happening. Delays were happening. And at this point, whenever it was only last week that we had the admission that, yes, we have run out of region. This is nobody's doing. We understand that there is a global challenge. If the thing is not available worldwide, it's not available. So let us all know, and then we'll all prioritize the testing. I perfectly agree with Director General that if you have fewer test kits, we have to use it wisely so that we can make the most public health sense out of it. And by this, it means prioritization. So one will prioritize people with symptoms who have higher risk of infecting other people more than people without symptoms. One will prioritize people in hospital whose decision or test results is required for clinical decision making. One would prioritize healthcare workers whose results we need to be able to get the workforce to continue. Because when you have delays in the health sector with test results, the challenge is twofold. First, you have healthcare workers more exposure. Therefore, more of the workforce is not available. Second, you have vulnerable patients who will get infected because another patient lying on the ward with them is a suspected case. We have taken the sample. You cannot move the pe person to a treatment center because you, do, you have not confirmed the person. And by the time the results come, changes that uh, delays in the testing come with. And with the new policy we are practicing, delays in test results are completely unacceptable. <laughs> and I would explain to you why. Hmm. You have a policy that says that in 14 days after you, you have been tested, if you are not on admission, if you are not sick, if you are not dead, you have recovered. What it means is that now clinicians are having to make retrospective diagnosis. When I say retrospective, we will diagnose you at the time you have already recovered. Yeah. People will come in, you take their sample, it takes you 14 days, 16 days. So by the time you are getting the results to inform the person that you are positive, by our definition, the person has recovered. 
So why did we use that test reagent? Exactly. Was it really useful? So if you delay the test results, it renders our whole system useless. So if you are having very few test kits, then we should test the people that we must test and generate the results as soon as it's possible to help us make decisions. If not, this retrospective diagnosis does not help anyone. Mm -hmm. And we are bearing the brunt of it because we are having a lot of our healthcare workers getting infected. As of now, we have close to 150 doctors infected. Other healthcare workers not counted yet. Yeah. We have lost four doctors. When we talk about this thing with passion, people don't understand. But it is closer than you think. So if you are having challenges, share the challenges. Let us all agree and see the way forward. If you tell us today that all that we have in the country is 1,000 test kits, and because of that, you are only going to test people who are sick. We are going to tell only health workers. Everybody would understand. But to the extent that we are all working and we don't know what is happening, then it's a challenge. Mm. My final submission on the issue of testing and all of this is that Director General made a very important statement earlier mm -hmm. that the samples that gave us this results, and we don't have access to this data, so we could not have independently made very this fine. analysis until he made the analysis for us. He's mentioning that majority of these samples came in around 18th to 20th. 16th of Asante June to 29th. Yes, but he mentioned that the larger chunk came around the 18th to 20th. Mm -hmm. I stand to be corrected. Around that time, epidemiologically, what was happening in this country? Have we analyzed it? What could have accounted for it? It was a time a party was having its rally, uh, primaries. We complained that people should be prosecuted for disregarding um, the, protocols. The, the social distancing protocol during these rallies. It is stated in a uh, primary, sorry, not rally. It is stated in our press statement. No one took notice of it. We are not talking politics. We are talking in terms of national interest. If you have a larger sample coming around this period, and this is what is happening, the effect of this EC registration exercise, if we not comply with them, we will not see now. We will probably see in two weeks, in three mm. weeks, because mm. that is when samples from that period will be coming up. Right. So I think that we have to be analyzing the, detail, uh, the data in detail because now we are having what would have looked like a larger single daily rise. But per his submission, we cannot make that from way back. anymore yeah. because it's covering several days. Right. Only the Ghana Health Service can tell us how much of that sample came in one day and what is the profile of those people. Mm. What is their age profile? Where is it coming from more? Mm. And I've dovetailed that, I would dovetail that into what I have been calling for in the past weeks, which is that the Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Health, and the National COVID Response Team must come clean and tell us as a nation, when are we going to take uh, a different direction? And what I mean is they have the data, we don't have the data, so we cannot analyze. But they should tell us the benchmarks. At what point we will say that no, looking at the daily rise, looking at what is happening, because what is published on their website is not daily rise, so we cannot analyze it. So since they can analyze it, they should tell us the benchmarks. At what point we say that, look, we have to reintroduce some restrictions. We need figures to back that. Mm. At what point we say that we have to restrict this area, this locality, this activity, or reintroduce new uh, restrictions plans. measures we need to know very well so though. that we can all monitor and police the process very well and this can only come from the health service because they have the data sure. and they must let us know what their plan b is very well thank you very much uh dr bayo professor Binka, uh specifically on the issue about retrospective diagnosis which is as a result of the uh delayed test results obviously as uh, dr bayo has indicated um is a challenge for or to our um, efforts in, in fighting this, 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 this disease. And as um, Dr. Bayo was making his submissions, I saw you um, nodding your head, you know, at some points. Any, 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 anything you'd want to say in addition to what um, Dr. Bayo has said regarding the testing? Yeah, so th thank you very much. Uh, I, I wish. I will confer on Dr. Bayo and uh, the status of an epidemiologist. <laughs> He's really put these things together. Right. Dr. Bayo, well done. You have done so well. <laughs> so the issue is, 
<laughs> the issue is that there is nothing like retrospective mm -hmm. in this case. We are we are in a pandemic. We, we, what is behind us only helps us to do better for what is going ahead. So the problem in a pandemic is what Dr. Bayo has said. I will summarize that in transparency. You can't say we are all fighting the disease. You are holding part of the information. You're not putting it forward. How do you expect your stakeholders to, to work with you? Today, the press has also been part of it. They have failed us. PPEs. Have you ever seen a publication of how many PPEs have been bought and how they've been distributed? No. Test kits. I don't know the number of test kits Ghana has, has bought over the times and how many is left and how the distribution of the test kits have been. Can you imagine we fought for extension of testing? Now those places are redundant. They, they, they don't have any uh, reagents to test. This cannot continue. Mm. We have to be transparent. For us, you're asking us to give you an understanding of uh, what is going on. The data is not on the website. I'm not the one collecting the data. So we are also working with what they are ready to put across. Why can't they put these things across? When we decided to open up, they have some conditions that government has to fulfill. And one of them is that we have to test people. Now schools have gone to, uh, students have gone it's to fine. school. If three students in one school uh, start getting ill, what shall we do? We'll test, we have to test them. And we have to test all the people there. Or, but we are opening up the conditions that we need to uh, uh, fulfill are not being fulfilled. And we are trying to uh, and, uh, what, allocate uh, uh, who is at, uh, at fault and so on. No, there is nothing like retrospective. The testing, we want to uh, appeal to the ministry uh, and the government to broaden the test. As an epidemiologist, the RT-PCR is not so great for me. It is good for Dr. Bayo and his team who are doing clinical work. Let's reserve those tests for people who need to be treated. For us who are following the virus in the population, an RDT test is good for us. Its sensitivity might be 40%, but we can test hundreds of people. Somebody is blocking the RDTs from coming on board. And then you are telling us you have a problem. No, we will not accept that. We are in a pandemic. We can't be approaching uh, 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 what uh, 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 blame. Number two, if you cannot test, you must be able to quarantine people and you must be able to isolate them. You don't leave them in the community and come back and say, okay, two, two weeks. No, that person, when the sample was taken, should go into quarantine. If he, they turns out to be pop, uh, negative, he goes home. If it turns out to be positive, he goes into isolation. These are basic things that have nothing to do with importation. These are basic things we've been saying. Go and ask. I hope TV3 will go and look at the quarantine facilities available in the country today and the isolation facilities. You know, and the numbers are going up. If we don't do those parts, which we is in our domain to be able to do that, then we can't be blaming this thing on, 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 on testing. Testing will be done. Without a test, we cannot find who has a disease and we cannot be ahead of the disease. The disease will stop us one day in our own Right in our tracks. Because the <laughs> yes, right in our tracks. Because <laughs> the numbers of people who are going to be ill will be so many, mm. they have services. I mean, 150 doctors infected. Where are we going? Yeah. Right. We have to do something better than that. Right. And today, when we are talking about testing, I will, if I am a health worker, I will insist I'm tested. Mm. Otherwise, I'm not going to the work from. Mm, very I well. I have to know. They, 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 they have to be protected. There's, there's too many people getting infected. Sure. That is not acceptable. Very well. Please. Very well, Prof. Thank you for that. We need to take a break. And uh, when we come back, we will be putting to the Ghana Health Service the issues about the call for transparency regarding um, the equipment, the testing kits, the numbers, daily figures, which would be then used by the professionals to make their own analysis. As it is, the GHS is the one that has the numbers and are unable to be um, shared with other persons who could, on their own, make their own deductions. We'll see you shortly after this break.
Welcome back. This is The Key Points, and we're still live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7, and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we are on Zoom having a conversation about our fight against COVID-19 with the experts. We have um, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaji. He's the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. Also, Dr. Titus Bayo. He's the Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. And Professor Fred Binka a professor of epidemiology. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, let me go straight to Dr. Abwaji now. Doc, I believe you heard um, your co-panelists, Dr. Bayou and uh, Professor Binka in the submissions, essentially um, looking at the situation about testing and um, how we're doing on that. The GMA is saying that. Let's, uh, sorry about that. Let's see yeah. how we can work together and help with the situation. But first, they are able to do that if the Ghana Health Service is transparent, is able to share information regarding, for instance, the number of test kits we have, PPEs available and all of that, so that when it comes to testing, they'll be, they'll be able to prioritize. It would help with, with that. I believe that is a laudable call. What is um, the, 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 the challenge with this? How, why is GHS or the Ghana Health Service unable to you know, make available those kinds of information? Now, beyond that, there's also the information about, or if you like, data. Because as, as, uh, up until the time you indicated that the numbers we have now uh, are coming out as a result of the testing that was done between the period 16 June to 29 June, that information wasn't readily available. And so we are, I mean, people are not able, or persons who could on their own get into certain analysis are not able to do that. What is the constraint? And why is GHS not able to do what the GMA is calling for? <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, um, I don't know um, why the issue of transparency is coming. We meet GMA quite often. Um, we have the information. See, if you look at just the dashboard alone, if you look at the dashboard alone, you will have issues with that. But you see, we have what we call the all updates, and um, which is all part of the website that gives you the daily positives as of the date sample was taken. So there's a lot of information. It also gives you information about how many tests have been done in that particular day. Uh, and there are many people that we are working with in different groups who are assisting the service and the Ministry of Health in designing all this. So the issue of um, lack of transparency coming from GMA, etc., is quite, I mean, there's no information that GMA would demand that would not be the given to, to us. But even if you go, we are working with investors, they have access to investors, access to good day, KNUSC, KCCR. So any epidemiologist who wants information will, will get it. But even if you go, you have other, if you, I hope you go into the all updates where the updates are pasted, not just what you have on the dashboard, but it tells you what are the positivities, what are the the thing we are doing moving averages because we appreciate that uh, depending on how many tests are done that day how many are moved, you may not be able to agree that will give you what's the moving average all this information is out there for everybody to take a look at and so we are really not deliberately um hiding information from anybody or for that matter uh, hide. We work with titles. We what about the test the kits GMA available? Team. Test kits available. All those because he's saying that 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 kind of information would um, inform the kind of prioritization that goes into testing. What what do you say? Well, to that? I, I I I don't know um, how all these micro details will have to be shared with everybody every day, except when you demand for it. We know the number of tests that have been done. We have not been, we are not hiding anything from anybody. We have shown you that when we had a challenge with backlog, we took too many samples against our capacity. We responded by expanding the number of cell uh, this thing. We came to doing within 48 hours. We have a global challenge of reagents. Then we've never hidden that. Mm. Last week, Tuesday, we mentioned it. 
the previous week you mentioned it, Loguchi has said it. And so it's, uh, it's not that there's any deliberate effort to hide anything from here. We all mm. have to work together. And uh, we are all equally exposed as everybody. Very well. Now and so um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we must. In terms of um, PPEs, we use the government. They are distributed. Um, Dr. Bayo knows how many they, they have in Kolebu. If he wants to know um, if there are shortages, they will know. And so we are distributing and the numbers have actually increased. We have actually set up a team, a consultancy to quickly look at the total number of uh, health staff infected. But mm. we are also equally uh, uh, we are also equally concerned about that. Not just how many, but we want to know what are the circumstances so that we can respond appropriately. Mm. And this has been ongoing for the past few weeks. Mm. And we keep on updating. And that's how Dr. Bayou knows how many are infected. That's how we share on our citrips, etc. So I don't this is so if you really want full detail, even beyond the website, you go to the all updates and you see a lot more information beyond what you see in the dashboard as website. So um we are working with all of them. Um the universities, all right. uh, Sabinka, they are all part of our mm. team. And so I think if there's any further mm -hmm. The, the, the information that they need. They, they, they access Very well. I, I see Dr. Bayo smiling there. I'll go to him in a bit. But still on you, uh, Dr. Um, Abuaji. The president, I, I can't recall exactly which of his addresses, but one of them, he did indicate that a number of testing centers were coming on stream to help with the um, expeditious you know, testing. And indeed, subsequently, we were informed that some uh, testing centers had come on stream. And so we, at some point got to the situation where we had our backlog dealt with. But now we've gone, we seem to have gone back to that situation where we have backlogs, which is why test results are delayed. Can you tell yes, us currently how many testing centers? Three centers to ten. Three to ten. And currently, how many do we have? Three. So how ten. 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 We still have ten. Ten centers. But that's what we wanted to do. And we moved up to ten. Okay. We brought in the gene experts. We are putting one in Bulgar. Uh, upper East, Upper West Central, um, and then Volta and some other region. Very well. So then what is accounting? So, so, so what's causing the delays in the test result? Because the initial... Have, Carry on. But I've, I've said that they have, we have had logistical challenges okay. because of the global shortage. Very well. Very and well. so you don't have all the labs working at full capacity. Mm. The reference lab is working and that's why they are supplying, making sure that they are producing cases from Kolebu. Okay. Those are the six patients and other places. Noguchi well. is working. KCC is working. But they are not all working. If, for example, Kolebu, Noguchi has 10 PCRs and they are only ap applying a few, it reduces our capacity. And we have not hidden that from anybody. And we are working very hard to ensure that these okay. logistics are, are brought in and then we quickly catch up. Very well. Thank you uh, for that clarification. Dr. Bayo. Dr. Bayou, yeah, um, uh, how do you respond you. to, yes, the, the, the call for the GHS to share information? Uh, Dr. Baj is saying that ask for it, you'll be given. And indeed, the, the um, GHS is collaborating with the GMA and all other stakeholders. Your thoughts on that? And quickly, if you could do that in, in a minute for me, so that I move on to Professor okay. Binka for the last word. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I will say that we've had several meetings with the Ghana Health Service. Some of the points I'm raising here, we have raised them with them in, in, in separate meetings. Uh, there, are, we, there were points where we had challenges with how reports are generated, how they are uploaded to the website. We have mm -hmm. not hidden that from uh, Director General. I would want to state on record that the data that we have on the figures of doctors did not come from the Ghana Health Service. It did not come from any data that we've gotten from the Ghana Health Service. It's a data tracking system mm. that we as the GME put in place. And at some point, we had more details of doctors uh, uh, who were infected than even the Ghana Health Service. Because when we went to them uh, for some of these information, we were not getting. And I want to put that on record. We went trying to get how many doctors at some point were infected, what, how was their exposure and the related issues. We're not getting it. So we have to create our own data tracking system, and we got this as an association. But indeed, we collaborate with the Ghana Health Service on a lot of issues. Mm. And I would want to conclude by saying that we need to make this collaboration more 
and our call for transparency should not be read to mean that we are saying that they are deliberately hiding anything, but we are just saying that the way the data is coming and the kind of information available to us does not help. We are not asking Director General to put the details of test kits available on the website, mm. but we've been insisting from the first day for test prioritization. If you have a policy, you have a plan, and people are giving feedback from the ground that is not working as planned, you should be able to appreciate it. And I would be happy if TV3 can go to any health facility and ask the nurses, the doctors, what are their challenges with PPE? Can they tell how many PPEs they have in the hospital at that moment? So that if I walk into the ER at Kolebu, I am on duty today. I'm, I'm having to leave the show to go to duty. If I get there, I cannot get N95 to use this mm. morning. What, how do I prove it? And I'm saying it on record. This morning, my team, the doctors who I'm working with today, almost everybody, the N95 we are using, we've all had it, bought it ourselves. We have, and I'm on duty. And anybody who wants to challenge that can verify it. If Kolebu can tell me or Director General can prove that on my team today, we are all going to be supplied with N95, but we have suspected cases and some even confirmed cases that have come from there then they should prove it. So there are real issues. The right. policy may be beautiful, but on the ground, it may not be working as that. So they should well. take this feedback and improve it. Thank very you. Very well. Thank you very much, Dr. Bayou. Professor Benka, you have uh, the last uh, minute or two. And that, that, yeah, that well, it, so. Yes. So, so thank you very much. Let me make it very... Crown the conversation okay. with um, your thoughts. That, <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm not uh, going to continue with uh, who is done what and what that. But there are things we have not discussed this morning that I want to be... Sure. Uh, I want to make a contribution. First of all, I think that with the numbers that we are finding now, it is imperative that the EC and the government must provide face masks to all people who show up at registration centers and enforce them to use them. Mm. They must provide face masks to everybody. Let's stop trying to uh, what uh, apportion blame. The virus is coming, it's spreading. So the only tool we have today that will help us to sort that out is not only washing of hands. Right. In fact, number one tool is the face mask. So mask. everybody who shows up at any of those registration sites, if he doesn't have a face mask, must be provided with one and make sure that uh, he is wearing that during that period. Mm. That's one. The second thing is that Ghana Health Service and the team, please let's restrict we don't have enough test kits prof our let's time is up so if you could do clinical. it in 30 seconds yeah, for me please yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the clinical work but let's introduce the new test kit mm. the additives it's time for you to bring the additives on board and we should not continue to have ex excuses mm. finally transparency we can discuss that sure. we still are not very transparent <laughs> we must have transparency in the data that is provided so that we can have independent assessment of where we are going. Thank you very right. much. Right. Thank you very much to uh, Professor Binka. Mm -hmm. Indeed, uh, on that note of transparency, we draw the curtains on the show this morning and we've had uh, via Zoom, Dr. Titus Bay, your Deputy General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, GMA. Also, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaje, he's the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. And Professor Fred Binka, he's a professor of epidemiology, and we've been discussing our fight against uh, COVID-19. This has been the key points, and I do say a big thank you to you, our viewers and listeners, for making a date with us as usual. We'll be back here same time next week. Until then, do have yourselves a very good weekend, and do stay safe.